It's an open satanic worship ceremony, I guess, in the Goddard Tunnel. Yes. And uh, I saw it and I was like, my mouth hung open because it was so in your face, Luciferian and satanic. I would say we've probably not seen something that bold in the mainstream media. No, we haven't. In our lifetime. No, no. And, you know, um, th there, there's been an escalation and it, and it keeps getting faster and more bold and more prominent. The Illuminati symbols at the Super Bowls and these giant... Uh, musical performances in stadiums by music superstars and the Olympics. There are in your face occult messages and satanic messages and symbols, uh, which tells you there's a very powerful uh, Luciferian elite in this world, very active, and they're not hiding anymore. No, they're, they're they've, not. They, they've come out. Because they've progressed in their timeline to the point where they feel invulnerable and no longer have to hold back. In fact, they want to be more bold about it so that they can gather themselves more converts to their way. That would make pull sense. away from us. Yeah, that would make sense because here in the U.S. we have this uh, rise in uh, the, the satanic uh, uh, churches. Exactly. Um, uh, just openly recruiting, uh, evangelizing which wouldn't have occurred even five or six years ago. That's Are Christians ignoring what's in plain sight right now? And especially, are Christians paying attention to um, this really bad system? I'm afraid maybe not to enough. Um, there's a quote from a, <laughs> surprisingly, a Nazi scientist on how to lie to people. And he says, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for such a time as the state can shield the people from political, economic, and or military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes v vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent. For the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie and thus by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Interesting uh, quote. I feel like that's really what we have here. We have a lie that is so big and it is so in plain sight and it has been repeated over and over and over and over and over again to the point that people just accept it. And to oppress or, or, or to push back against the lie is to push back against almost the state. But the Bible says in Ephesians 5:11, take no part in the fruit unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. I feel like this is a really big topic. I came across a video that exposes a lot of things. Uh, I wanted to take some clips from it, but really I wanted to bring this to light and expose uh, these dark things that are very much in plain sight and being paraded around now uh, for the public. And so we're going to take a look at this. This is a, um, an interview um, and it was done in 2016. So that's eight years ago, but I was surprised at how this nails the uh, hits the nail on the head on a lot of things. So let's take a look at another clip. To, to grasp is a, is a truth that is hard for Christians to really own. And that is the world is exactly as the Bible says that it is. Yes, it is. And uh, there's an invisible world, Lucifer at the top, his hierarchy of demons. He compartmentalizes information on a need to know basis. Yep. And at the very top, um, there are men and women who are open Luciferians. Yes, indeed. They have committed themselves. They participate in rituals to the worship of Satan because, as you said, they believe that they're going to conquer Christ. Yep. And Satan is the true, or Lucifer is the, tr is, is the true God. That's right. Now, you said that, and I said that, and the Bible says that, but for some reason, that's, that there's almost a veil in the minds of many Christians. And I, and I pray as we interview you that the Holy Spirit would just break that veil of deception 
and, and that God's people could really see reality as it really is, instead of living in this kind of fog state, which is based on their uh, unbelief of, of God's Word. Well, let's use the Collider for our purposes. Okay. We'll come back to the Collider in just a minute. Strangely, I agree with that last comment, and my wife and I both agreed with that when we heard that. It feels very much tr accurate that there's almost like a veil covering the, the eyes of so many people about how obvious the worship of Satan has become in the world. And we see a cult, you know, in the Church of Satan very much on the rise. Uh, and we see paganism on the rise and we see open and overt occultic symbols in the private sector, in the entertainment sector, in the public sector. And it's almost like people are just like not even looking or if they're looking, they're not even seeing. And so in this interview between Paul McGuire and Anthony Patch, they're looking into this. And I actually like this Alpha and, and Omega Productions video. I'll try to link this. I downloaded it. I don't know if it'll stay online forever. Um, that's how it is, how it goes, unfortunately, with these types of channels. Um, but the, the thing that I think is really interesting here is we have a lot of obvious and evil being paraded. What are they doing having an occultic ritual in front of a tunnel in Switzerland? Uh, what does that have to do with the Hadrian Collider? And why is there all this um, occultic imagery on site at CERN? What is that occultic imagery doing on site at the UN and at Davos and everywhere you look almost? And he's going to link a few things together here in this in this video that I think is really interesting. It's a 51 minute video. Uh, so I can't pretend to give you the full thing, but I'm going to try to give you the, the, the basics. I, I really think that if you have the time, this is worth your time because it, he talks a lot about um, these systems of control and how they are um, gaining more and more control over the world. All right, we're going to come back to the collider in a minute. I want to fast forward to minute mark 40 in this video. Brief. Now, um, let's get back to the, to the B system, because obviously the B system is in the Bible in numerous places, Revelation 13 especially, with the false prophet and the Antichrist and the mark of the beast, which could be a microchip implant, uh, nanochip, uh, whatever. Um, you talk about, it's difficult for me to pronounce the name of the, the computer. The adiabatic. The adiabatic. Means without heat process, adiabatic mm -hmm. quantum computer, AQ, AQC is the easier way to talk about it, AQC. Okay, now you relate this to the B system, I want to find out why, sure. but you you tell us, and I want our viewers to grasp this, that this, are they building this computer now? It's already been built in the model 2048. They started with a 128 model. Wait, not the year, but the no, model the number, model number. 2048. Right. It's, it's already built. Well, there have been multiple generations that have okay, been but built. The, but, but the early stages, like early the early one, Apple... first one was 2008. Wow. The 2048 was released to the public right. in January of last year, 2015. Now, you describe it as equivalent to 7 billion human brains. H have they, has, has this computer reached that level yet? Yes. So this computer... How big is it, by the way, physically? Well, interestingly, it's housed in a black cube. Can you say Mecca? Right. Black sun, the worship of, and we go to 2001 Friends. with the obelisk, right. right? It wasn't a cube, but it was a black right. rectangle. How, how big of a black cube so is it? So we're talking thousand? about something that's about the size of this stage here in the studio. So, so this computer is about a black cube about the size of this television set, right. and yet it has the... That's an interesting quote, isn't it? Creator of the D-Wave quantum computer artificial intelligence is the altar of an alien god. It's interesting how people who are really deep into quantum science and AI and quantum AI talk about it very religiously. I've mentioned that many times on this channel before, but it's like even Elon Musk said, you know, he, he says in doing this, we're summoning a demon. It's really interesting to see the parallels. And I think the one about the Kaaba is a little bit inconsequential. I don't really think there's a lot to that, but I think there is a lot to the quantum computer and the power of seven 
billion human brains in one machine uh, as being extremely consequential for humanity, especially as those things have gone in the last eight years from very much an unproven science to now a very much proven science. And they have been built in much larger capacity since this interview eight years ago. But how he nailed it at that time surprises me and really makes me believe that God has revealed something to people about this up upcoming system because God chooses to, to, to say things before they happen. The Bible says that, um, that he does speak in this way, it's in, the, in that realm of prophecy. And, and yet people don't like prophecy. And I was even wondering, why didn't I hear about this video in 2016? Well, people weren't sharing it. People don't really care for this type of content and material until they need it, until they realize, oh, shoot, what's really going on? Oh, shoot, we're being deceived. How do we get back to what's true and what's right and what's good? Uh, and so he's going to go a little further on this. I want this clip to run just a little bit more, and we're going to skip ahead a little bit further. The intelligence and memory or whatever that's equivalent to 7 billion human brains. That's correct. Now, this is a housing. This is a, a shield that separates it from all electromagnetic interference okay. to maintain the stability of the processor. Okay? It's what's called coherence and decoherence in computer science. But inside the cube is something that is arranged just like the spinal column of a human. Hmm. And it has what are known as qubits that are essentially constructed of gold, but other components. But these are not transistor-based. Qubits are a complete departure in the technology from transistors, which are silicon gate mm -hmm. um, model, gate model um, processors. This is a complete quantum leap, leap into a, another way of processing information. And it does so so quickly that it has no relevance, no comparison to the gate model transistor-based, even transistor quantum computer. So we're talking about something that most people who've not studied Mm -hmm. The adiabatic quantum computer process can't wrap their heads around. I want to read this quote for you. Quantum computation will be the first technology that allows useful tasks to be performed in collaboration between parallel universes. The basic presupposition of relativity, and if you go back to Sch Schrodinger in the early 1900s, is that there is there can be a box, and inside this box there can be a cat, and there can be a sensor that is able to pick up on the oscillation of a nuclear particle and if it, it, it detects it in this state or this state the cat will live or die and in this uh, sort of false mathematical question and scenario he creates the possibility that maybe the cat is both dead and alive in fact maybe at the time that you sense that quantum uh, or sorry that the nuclear oscillation of this this atom um, maybe an infinite number of universes are created in which the cat is either dead or alive. And it, it's this departure from reality into this world of, uh, in their minds, parallel universes. But in, in my mind, I'm thinking parallel dimensions. Yes, um, I think we do believe that we have the physical dimension. We do have a spiritual dimension as well. And so there's this bridging over of people into this they think it's a parallel universe they think it's a multiverse they think it's some other <laughs> simultaneous timeline in which you know something happened differently but i think what's actually happening in in these quantum com computers is very um deeply spiritual is as much as it is technological uh this is the coldest place in the universe inside one of these quantum computers it is is close to absolute zero Kelvin degrees as you can possibly get. And so inside that space, they're, they're detecting something. And I do think it's very interesting that the quantum computer does not operate on binaries, which is true or false, true or false, a silicon gate. It operates in trinaries, um, you know, true, false, or both. Is it true, false, or is it true and false? And I think I see a lot of parallels, at least between lies and that type of thinking, that it's not this or that, it could be both and. And I don't really believe that God has created a world of both and, a world of relativity, a world of, it depends on who you are, depends on your, you know, your framework. Uh, no, I think God has created a world of absolutes and the laws of the universe are absolute. 
And so as people have dot dove into quantum computation and into quantum theory, I see a lot of this uh, wrestling on what is reality, what is truth. And, uh, and, and, and then you see people like this talking about parallel universes. Now, the guy who's being interviewed believes in um, that, that what's happening at the Large Hadron Collider is opening a portal into the demonic world and consulting with um, demonic entities through this system. I think there's some interesting um, things to explore there. I think that as these things are getting brought closer and closer into the light, it's allowing people to make a more educated decision on them or at least observing them for what they are so that we can start to make decisions on how do we respond to uh, these types of things. Let's take a look a little bit more at this and then we're going to go ahead to Minimark 46 in this video. It's a very deep topic, but I want to be succinct here. It operates interdimensionally. When I spoke of earlier that they're already communicating with the other side, without having opened a gateway, a portal, a physical portal in the dimension, they're communicating using this computer because, and this comes right from the manufacturer, this is public disclosure information. I didn't have to get this in a secretive manner. They do what are called combinatorial programming. They take all possible solutions and at one time feed it into the machine through an interface, which happens to be a black cube itself, the interface device, and by their own admission, it enters into another dimension where the processing takes place, and then they extract from that other dimension the solution to the combinatorial problem. That is communication. I don't know if you can read that, but it's about the quantum computer. It promises to solve some of humanity's most complex problems. It's backed by Jeff Bezos, NASA, and the CIA, by the way, and Google, and IBM, and others. Each one costs... $10 million and operates at 459 degrees below zero, and nobody knows how it actually works. <laughs> well, that's at least the article written about it. With an actual physical tool to another dimension. Now, when it's communicating to another dimension, is it communicating to, to a consciousness or an intelligence in another dimension? Yes. It is? Yes. Because it happens definitively, repeatedly, measurably, now this says a quantum computer taps directly into the fundamental fabric of reality, the strange and counterintuitive world of quantum mechanics to speed computation. They're able to do this consistently. There was a lot of doubt in the transistor-based world of quantum computing that mm -hmm. the, the company that put this quantum or qubit-based processor together, that they really were achieving any definitive answers mm -hmm. and that were reliable and coherent, okay, that were stable but they have proven over and over again. Let me give you one example of who's, who's purchasing Google. The first model was purchased by Lockheed and USC with an open public computer laboratory that the public can access with their first model and it has advanced through 512 model, for example, where two of which were purchased by Google a few years ago. They now have the 2048. The 20 there's been a lot of change in the last eight years, but he's really onto something. And, and it's very interesting to see who is the purchasers now of quantum hardware and who's the purchasers of quantum um, systems and who's building these. Open AI, uh, Microsoft. I mean, you got people announcing things like Open AI announces Q star or Q asterisk as their new platform that they're so excited about. And here I've been, I've been mentioning this for a while, guys, that quantum AI is likely that uh, super intelligence that they're trying to build. They're trying to build something and they're calling it, in the words of Yuval Noah Harari, their own version of God, right? That's capable of, of making their own religious texts and building people into homo deus. Um, and it all comes back to this quantum space. We looked at the quantum physicists last week and their claims about how they don't understand reality. Maybe we're all living in a simulation. And what's kind of nuts is that you have those people basically given so much funding and so much authority and so much power. And how are they spending it? Spending it in these ways. Um, Let's take a look at the minute mark 46 in this video. Uh, he, he, uh, he, he stops talking as much about the quantum hardware and starts talking about the linkage between people and this hardware, which I, I think is going to be pretty uh, important. Connects with the B system in the book of Revelation. 
Well, the beast system we hear of, if you don't accept the mark of the beast, then no man can buy or sell. All of that control mechanism, how do you control over 7 billion people? Right. You have a computer that's equivalent to 7 billion people. That's why I right. cite that, coming from the manufacturer's own citation. How do you control 7 billion people? Well, I know a room full of Davos um, elites who are meeting in about eight days who are probably asking that question. Okay, so I'm just repeating their information, but the point is you have to have a sophisticated system to be able to control not just the movement of people and the movement of goods and transactions and governments, but the minds of people. Now, that sounds like an interesting power proposition. In a world where money doesn't really matter and even the world's most wealthy people are, are looking at their piles of money and asking, what can I really get done with this? How are they spending it? Influencing thought, influencing elections, influencing... I mean, just think about like the way that ultra-rich people spend their money. And why are they gathering together in these world economic forums to try to create global policy with their money? It's because they're trying to influence something with their money. But a little more on that in a minute. You're creating a surf class of human beings. Right. When you accept the mark of the beast, you lose all awareness that you have even been modified. You don't even know that you've been changed. So your memories are erased, like some of the sci-fi movies. Well, in the sense of your own self-awareness, your right. own knowledge of your soul. Okay, so when you take the biblical mark of the beast, which mm -hmm. is uh, technology, it, it's it, it's deeper than than it what, goes to the. It goes to tell us how it goes to the. DNA. <laughs> okay. This sounds far-fetched, but when you accept the mark of the beast, what you are actually doing is accepting into your body and then controlled from an external source. That control mechanism, the linkage, comes through the electromagnetic connection. We can call it microwaves or whatever, or ELF, extremely low frequency, be it... I think this is where it's getting an, into the little bit of the speculative space, and I, I would caution people against going too far into linkages with um, that are not overt. I do believe that when the Mark of the Beast arrives on the scene, uh, that it's going to be a really obvious choice, and I don't believe God would allow his people to be deceived. Um, it there are some really clear markers about it in the book of Revelation. And if it comes to pass in a physical sense, um, we're going to see the worship of the beast in the beast system, if you want to put it that way. We're going to see uh, a complete elimination of buying and selling from those who do not accept this system. I've seen a lot of people linking this to the COVID vaccine, and I feel like that is uh, a both dangerous and false uh, teaching because the COVID vaccine, although it did bring um, a lot of a lot of people looking at it, you know, wondering about this, it, it did not bear the economic function. It also did not bear the religious function that we are told about in the book of Revelation. And so even though there's a lot of people who have speculated and I saw the 5G antennas there and stuff uh, about, you know, are we modifying our DNA? Well, yes, our mRNA vaccines are modifying DNA somewhat. Uh, and I think we should watch out for that, especially as people are trying to create these, spread them out everywhere and solve everything with mRNA uh, vaccines. I think that's not going in a good direction. But I think the, the interesting bit is the, um, the linkage between people and technology is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. Especially if you just take the current trajectory and you follow it down a few steps, what is the ultimate end of this technology as it integrates with people. You see already governments asking that question. You have Canada has a transhumanism uh, statement. You have um, others like Elon Musk with Neuralink uh, talking about that. You have people in Europe who are, who are doing implantables and making payment systems that are based on, um, on implantables. And so you have a lot of people trying to merge humanity with technology in a, a more profound way. And I think you're going to see uh, this system come to um, come to pass, I, I poss possibly within our lifetime. I, I see a lot of conversation suggesting to that happening at some very high levels. Uh, we're going to just take 20 seconds more of this video, and then we're going to come back to another segment. Whatever frequency, but that is the link to humans from that computer. And that is the beast system that controls us which has been modified and then it changes our thought processes. It rewires our synapses in our own mind. Right. Because our brains are constructed from our DNA. 
Right. You modify the core, you modify the brain. I, I want to uh, share. I think that it's interesting how, you know, thought processes are being controlled by artificial intelligence already. I mean, if you have a phone in your pocket, you're spending potentially hours a day being influenced by artificial artificial intelligence and what it suggests to you for content. You're, you know, we're, we're all on these devices and, and these devices are guiding th our thoughts. Now, interestingly, the CEO of Nokia, let me see if I can get this ex quote exactly right. Um, you know, Nokia makes the cell phones, right? The CEO of Nokia says that smartphones will be obsolete by 2030. That's only six years away. And so he sees, I guess, um, my impression of, of these quotes was that there is a merging of the smartphone into the person. So we already have a device that gives us what some would call superhuman ability um, and a lot of crazy potential with these devices. And, and, and that potential is getting closer and closer to the human fabric and possibly some are saying will be integrated into the human fabric. I think that that's going to create some real problems, um, especially for people who don't want that system. Take, for example, even just the palm scanning at Whole Foods that was introduced within this last year. I mean, you have a payment system and an entry exit system that's all based on palm scanning. And if you scan your palm, you go in the store, you buy your stuff, you leave the store, you scan your palm, right? You pay for your stuff. It's pretty interesting. I mean, we're seeing, we're getting closer and closer into the humanity um, with what is what is expected to be scanned and known and digitized about us. You see the world coin by open, uh, open AI's CEO, Sam Altman, a retina scan currency where you can buy and sell and pay based on a retina scan. You see the same technology at the passports and, and terminals in airports. You can get a facial scan and they will identify you by your biometrics on your face, right? But I think that all of those systems are somewhat lossy, somewhat faulty, somewhat hackable. And I think that's why we're going to see a need for a single uh, form of authentication um, and possibly, possibly, possibly multi, but a, really a, a more unhackable and centralized system, which uh, leads really nicely into our conversation here about what's going on at Davos next week. But um, before we get to that, so maybe you don't know this, but the World Economic Forum meets in Switzerland once a year and they meet in Davos, which is pretty, pretty close to Geneva, where they're where they're building this large Hadron Collider uh, and they're studying dark matter and they're start studying, you know, the origins of the universe and, and this guy's assessment, uh, trying to open a portal between dimensions. Now, Stephen, even Stephen Hawking, a physicist, has his <laughs> concerns about this and saying, like, I don't know, you know, if you really want to do this, like, potentially you could destroy everything. Um, anyway, people are trying to control gravity. People are trying to control um, reality. And they're trying to use dark matter to do it. It's pretty, pretty crazy. Let's take a look here at this other clip. And then we're going to get into just a little bit more about um, CERN and stuff. And, and then we'll wrap this up. Last year, the uh, previous director of the Collider facility announced that their goal openly is to open a dimensional gateway to another dimension. You might call it a portal. Mm -hmm. And when you begin to put that in the context of our everyday reality, that seems absurd. Mm -hmm. And he also made the statement that we don't know what we will find or what may come through from the other side, but we're willing to risk it. This is mind blowing. So we're not talking even really about your research. We're not talking about speculation. So, so Anthony, this is it's so interesting how the predictive programming also goes along with this. You can see some of these movie clips. This one's from a 2009 film, Angels and Demons. But you can see sort of how uh, the world has been conditioned to accept uh, certain things of the supernatural origin coming through portals. We see other, there, there's tons of B-roll in, um, in this video that kind of points to that. And it's like, wow how we have been so exposed to this over and over and over and over again, almost like that quote from Joseph Goebbels. If you tell a big lie enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. You know, and, and this idea of like, what's really going on here with the Large Hadron Collider? 
I think it should be paid attention to because things happen in secret science rooms that affect everybody. Take the nuclear bomb, for example. The Manhattan Project was a secret program of physics, and they came up with a weapon that could blow the whole world up a few times over. And you have the same types of people now studying with great intensity and great funding um, the, the quote-unquote God particle uh, that they're experimenting with in the Large Hadron Collider, and they're, they're, they're looking at creating interdimensional gateways, and where are those gateways leading us to, and what are we sensing on the other side, and why is the director of this saying that we are opening a gateway potentially, and we don't know what we're <laughs> finding on the other side? Um, yeah, I mean, should we, should we maybe be asking that question, what are you really up to, or what are you trying to do, or what are you, exper what are you experiencing <laughs> as you open these gateways? This, this again, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is the published statement of the former head of CERN, and he's talking about did uh, did he did he use the word entity? What word did he use? No, he didn't assign a title to what right. might come through. He just right. that he didn't know what would come through. He didn't know what would come through. So right. that's kind of ominous. We're, it is. We're, we're we're cracking open a hole in this dimension. Yep. Am I correct? Yep. I mean, that's the director of CERN saying something could come through the dimensional doors at the Large Hadron Collider. And we see like rituals of this sort happening. I don't know if you guys have, I'll try to try to post a little clip if I can. Um, but these rituals happening where people are opening gateways and you even see that in, in movies and Stargate and Warcraft film and lots of other films. It's, it's been predictively programmed into our minds to think about and to accept and uh, find that to be a little interesting and we don't know what would come through from your research tell us what you think he was implying and what has your research revealed about what's really going on well they the research has revealed that they're already in communication with the other side with entities on the other side very soft this this is mind-blowing the research has shown that they're already in communication with what on the other side? Well, in my frame of reference, and I right. think we share this, these right. would be demonic entities. And what, what have they assigned a word to the communication to these beings or whatever are in another dimension? No, other than to say that these perhaps are our benevolent ancestors from the stars who are coming to solve all of our problems and remove all of our ills from our society. This is so powerful. This is the, what you're talking about uh, is a paradigm shift that's just about ready to detonate on planet Earth. That's correct. This is going to shake up the faith of many Christians and, and people of belief and non belief. It's going to shake their very view of reality to the core, just like when Darwin's theory of evolution was promoted, it, it just tore up people's view of reality. You know, that's right. oh, God didn't create us. We evolved animals. I mean, that, that just ripped up the fabric of the entire sociological, spiritual structure of the planet. It did, and it actually sparked some pretty intense wars. This guy named Karl Marx, ever heard of him? Yeah, he was a Darwinist, wasn't he? Paradigm shift. Right, a paradigm shift. And so we're... I don't know if you saw that logo flash on the screen, but that's the logo for CERN, and it looks surprisingly like a 666 as well, which is, I find all of these repetitions of those three numbers pretty interesting when you when you get into these high ranks and people who are supposedly in contact with other beings. Um, I find that to be a little bit odd. Last part of this video I want to respond to is at minute marker 135. He's talking about what is CERN and how does this link up with other systems of power? Last clip, and then we're going to make our closing comments. Which is a nuclear research facility utilizing a particle collider. Now, it's, it's, it's in a giant, uh, somewhat circular uh, shape that covers, how many miles is that whole collider? Yeah, as you travel along it, you cover 27 miles. 27 17 miles. 17 kilometers. Well, geographically on the map, it's located on the border between Switzerland and France. Mm -hmm. It's near Geneva. It's a sovereign state unto itself. What, what's a sovereign state unto that itself? That would be a self-governing body. So, they are so, much like the Vatican. So the cult. Okay. We have to talk about this. 
The Large Hadron Collider is a sovereign state, which would make it the fourth sovereign state that I'm aware of in the world. Okay, we're going to take a look at others. He mentioned the Vatican. There's an obelisk in the Vatican. And the Vatican is actually not the property of Italy. It is its own sovereign state. Even though its property is within Italy, it is considered its own deal. Similar to Washington, D.C. in the United States. It's actually not part of the USA. It is its own district. It's its own municipality type of thing where it's it's actually its own supreme state even though it's in the usa it's not the usa look into it yourself the same is true of the city of london huh isn't that interesting and here in these four these cities well london um, is actually a, such a financial hub of the world. It is incredible how much financial power they hold within World Bank and within world governments. It's like the, <laughs> some have even said that the Great British Empire never really uh, collapsed. It just changed into a bank. Um, <laughs> and, and there's really some, some good support to that. Uh, the spiritual um, links with the Vatican. You know, the Vatican is the spiritual capital of the world. Some would say it houses Rome, Italy, and the Pope. And you see a lot of spiritual authority coming through there. But it's also not, it's interesting that that's also not a country. It's a sovereign state. And then you have the military capital of the world, which I would say is Washington, D.C. The U.S. is still the world's more, most powerful military. China's growing quickly, right? But that military is also under the control of a sovereign state. And so you have Geneva as well being the fourth totally sovereign state. And there's, there, I'm like, okay, but where are the others? And I'm like trying to figure this out. And I'm like looking into it and, and like trying to figure this out. I, I've got a lot of possibilities, um, but I think there's probably seven of these. Because the beast system sits upon seven hills. Could that be referring to the seven hills surrounding Rome, perhaps? And actually the Vatican is at the top of this? Or could it be that these are actually seven different cities uh, that sit on many waters? And think about Shanghai, Singapore, Monaco. Um, yeah, and even the United Nations, technically, the UN is not a part of New York. Even though it is in New York, the United Nations is its own deal. It's like a sovereign state in a very, very miniaturized version on a campus in New York. So there's a lot of these around the world. And what are they doing? And why are they, you know, why do they need this type of insulation power? Now, you can see CERN's logo, a little sus. I mean, it, it reminds me of other types of parallels between 666 and um, logo design that are just, it's almost enough where it makes you think but it's not enough where it's super obvious, but kind of like Google Chrome's logo, very subtle in terms of how they have embedded 666 into this logo, sort of like Monster Energy Drink. By the way, if you look at a 30 year profitability sheet of Mar Monster Energy Drink is the most profitable company on tr publicly traded in the last 30 years. So you see these companies that are like okay with embedding this type of imagery. And I find it interesting how linked they are to, um, yeah, pretty occultic things. Uh, in front of CERN, there's a statue of Shiva. And Shiva is the Hindu uh, destroyer of worlds. Um, and it's pretty interesting how much happens in front of this statue. And it's, it's interesting to see this, this, um, this linkage between that and this and, and Robert Oppenheimer, who was a believer in... Um, Hinduism and said a quote from the Bhagavad Gita now I am death now I am become death the destroyer of worlds what did he mean he actually meant Shiva uh, who is the destroyer of worlds now Shiva is an interesting figure within Hinduism because it's a dual um, sexuality figure or a trans figure uh, both man and woman which if you kind of connect the dots there that reminds me an awful lot of Baphomet who is also a trans figure, also a man and woman, who seems to have some occultic imagery embedded within the Vatican. I'm not skilled enough at this time, and I don't have the full research to make that full case, but I find it to be an interesting linkage, especially when you start to consider what we were recently talking about uh, with other linkages of <laughs> Addis and 
you look at the history and you look back at um, Libertas and why are these things typically presented as this male-female duality. And then you see, you know, all that all the way back to Egyptian mythology and you have the obelisks which represent the sun worship and you have um, these same obelisks in the following age after the Egyptian age and sort of the, I don't know if you want to call it the Phoenician age, but the Babylonian age at the very least, uh, where that same obelisk was representing the worship of Ishtar. And then you carry that same imagery forward and you get to the Greek age and you have the Greek pantheon and you have the worship of Ishtar in Athena. And then you take that same line of thinking and you take it into the Roman age and you end up with the Roman pantheon. And then now you have people in the USA who build a statue of an ancient pagan Roman goddess um, and want to celebrate that on top of our state capital in DC, in New York. And you start to see all of these like lines all pointing to the same thing. And that's why I find that this is all just like, it's, it's so out there and so in your face that it's almost so loud that people are accepting it as though it was truth and though it was good and though it was moral and when actually it's quite not. Here's what I think is happening at Davos. The funny thing about people is that you put them in a conference center and they basically talk about the same things that they always talk about. And what are these people who are going to Davos always talking about? Quantum supremacy. I find that to be quite interesting. You have Sam Altman. He's talking about Q-Star and sort of the quantum leap. You have uh, people in the economic space talking about the need for quantum encryption and banking and the need for verifiable IDs that are quantum verifiable. And you have people of the Yuval Noah Harari variety who are thinking very spiritually about the world and how we become homo deus right and you have the governance of the world you know they, they're wanting more control in a world world that is quickly spinning out of control they want more tools to understand what people are spending their money on and how where they're going and you see canada freezing bank accounts for truckers and stuff like that happening and, and so the governance people are wanting more control and so they're looking to quantum systems to provide that control and ai systems and it's funny, but you get all of these people in one room and what are they going to talk about? They're going to talk about that. Funny that they actually have their agenda online, though. I was not expecting that. These meetings happen behind closed doors. So I was not expecting to see uh, the agenda online, but they, they put it online. Now, this is the vanilla public version. But Davos 2024 is the 54th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. Under the theme Rebuilding Trust, the meeting aims to... To restore collective agency and reinforce the fundamental principles of transparency, consistency, and accountability. Here's their four areas that they want to see increased trust. Now, Bill Gates is there. What is he always talking about? Agenda 2030, right? Interesting that that's the same year that the Nokia CEO said we would be done with smartphones. That maybe they'd be integrated by that point. I find that to be quite interesting. That's only six years away. By In that time we will have already arrived at the need for quantum encryption. It will already be so super, super important. And maybe you're hearing about that the first time this year, but that's not the last time you're gonna be hearing about that. Achieving security and cooperation in a fractured world. Oh, that sounds like a <laughs> very interesting political angle um, that you could apply quantum to and achieve more security uh, and cooperation. Hmm. That's interesting. Creating growth and jobs for a new era. How can the government, business, and civil society come together around a new economic framework? Oh, interesting. That sounds a lot like an economic use for quantum. That sounds almost like you might be rolling out some new central bank digital currencies and maybe having some tools so that people can receive those currencies and spend them. I don't know. I don't know, Davos. Maybe that's what you're talking about behind your closed doors. 
artificial intelligence as driving force for the economy and society. How can we use AI to benefit all? How is the divergent regulatory landscape balancing innovation with society risks? How will AI interface with other transformative technologies, including 5, 6G and quantum com computing and biotechnology? Wow. Just go out right there and say it. I mean, what are you looking forward to at Davos, guys? Quantum supremacy? Hmm. How do, can we use AI to benefit everybody? How will it interface with 5G and other transformative technologies like biotech? Oh, it's almost like it's almost like you might be gearing up to like maybe develop some kind of financial tool that you could give to the world and then the world would just embrace it <laughs> and start adopting it. Funny thing, like I feel like I almost know what they're talking about, but we're not invited. A long-term strategy for climate, nature, and energy. Now, here's where this all gets religious. I don't know if you guys have seen how devoted people are to the climate religion. It's it's incredibly devoted. There are people who are willing to die for the climate, people who are willing to kill for the climate, and the amount of passion that these people feel is very religious. Um, I believe we should safeguard our climate. We should be taking care of our resources, but all of that what we have is a service to human humanity from God, something we were given. Um, and it's not to be worshipped in itself. It is a something we are to use to help each other and to bless each other and to cooperate. All right. So anyway, long-term strategy for climate. How do we re re achieve net neutrality and, and all this carbon neutral? So not too surprising. But what I, I find interesting is... In my mind, I was thinking, what do these people always talk about? And when you get these people together, what are they going to talk about? They're going to be talking about quantum su supremacy. And when I look at the agenda, I see that being very likely. This is the religion of the future. This is the techno religion that, that Yuval Noah Harari is talking about. This is the singularity uh, or the ultimate deity of these people. It's a system that rules everything. It is a quantum enabled system that is running AIs that are so powerful it can prevent other AIs from being formed. That, uh, and it is a centralization of all data and information into one fabric of the quantum internet so that the, the internet can understand everything that's being transmitted every single place. And the internet can understand every single thing that is being spent and how, who has the money and who doesn't and who's at risk and, and so on and so forth. The funny thing is, they're not really wanting Christians to enter this new community that they're creating. And I call it a new community because that's the words that the quantum physicist used. She's talking about the quantum community. And that community is exclusive. It is the same as the people who are saying science is science, love is love, um, you know, women's rights are human's rights, and, and black lives matter. It, it is the same thing. That is the prototype of the community of the quantum community. The quantum community are, are the people who like the guy on IBM's main stage came out to say this year, he said, I want you to think about this all day. I'm starting to look at quantum as though it was truth. Quantum is not binary. It's relative. It is based on Einstein's, all of his science that's all about relativism. And you have transhumanism, you have transgenderism, you have everything is relative, no absolutes, governance by an AI system, and then you have people thinking that they're gods. The quantum community is very interested in digital monetary tools that are non-actual. Very much like the Roman Empire, just before its collapse, it was facing severe inflation. And so the issues about currency and the tie between currency and actual uh, precious metals was broken as they had to basically print money in the ancient Roman Empire just before its fall. We're actually at that point again where money is no longer having a very strong link to actual things because the actual maybe you don't have to work to get money and maybe you have certain guarantees of certain goods and services whether or not you have worked at all to deserve them so the link between work and money is dissolving and the link between um money and actual precious materials is also dissolving since we got off the gold standard and no currency since has really been able to get back on the gold standard I find that to be very interesting and then over here you know you have 
the quantum community, right? But you have, I think, a, a rift forming between people who are believing of this variety and those who are believing in this variety. The governance should be done by humans who have a soul, that we shouldn't be governed by a computer. People who believe in absolutes, people who believe in cash and physical monetary tools um, as re representative of value and the I, I call these people the analog community. The guy from uh, Google calls these people the dinosaurs. Um, others who talk about these people talk about them as being the irrelevant people of humanity or the useless class of humanity uh, that is formed when the rest of the world goes integrated with AI. Uh, who is left behind? People who don't integrate with AI, basically. Um, when somebody says you won't lose your job to AI, you'll lose your job to somebody who uses AI better than you. What they're referring to is this type of people over here. And they're saying the people who are going to lose out are this type of people over here. But what I find so interesting about this situation that we're approaching soon, it's really a disappearing middle. It's that you will have to choose your alignments. And that's why alignment, I think, is going to be the word of the next year. Um, it's going to be the word we hear a lot about. A AI systems that are aligned with certain governments, with certain people and certain businesses. Uh, but also, I think, <coughs> people. What is their alignment to uh, these systems or against them? Um, and why do they have these persuasions that they have? I know why I can't sign up to worship something other than God. I hope that you do too. And that's why I think that this veil being over people's minds and hearts isn't really that helpful. Um, people not knowing why they don't agree with certain artists or people just not caring if certain artists are using this type of symbolism and certain businesses are using this type of symbolism what it, what it does is it all contributes and it all serves the lie. And yet, I want to end this video actually with some encouragement. I want, I want to encourage you that you would go now that you've spent 51 minutes on my video. I don't even know who's even watching this at this point. <laughs> now that you've spent 51 minutes on my video, I encourage you to go spend 51 more minutes uh, on A&O Productions. Um, video as well. I think it's, it's worth considering. And I think he's got some good points. I want to end up my video though, with revelation 21, four, Jesus will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Revelation one, seven, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see them, see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and him with me. Well, guys, I knew this was going to be our longest video yet. I don't regret spending my early hours of the morning uh, doing this. But I, I guess... What I think my heart needs to be fixed on is that Jesus is in control, even though humans are conspiring against God. Jesus is very much still in, constro in control. That reminds me of Psalm chapter 2. You should think about this. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and cast away their cords. That one enthroned in heaven laughs, the Lord taunts them. Psalm chapter 2. You can think you can outsmart God. You can think you can try to do away with his word or uh, do away with his people. But he just laughs. <laughs> Take care. God bless.